I have a question for you. What do you think is the wrath of God? I was trying to figure out what the wrath of God had to do with garbage bins. <laughs> we'll soon find out. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I would think the wrath of God is when we deny his son. Mm -hmm. Judgment? Judgment? Yes. That's what old-fashioned ministers threaten you with. That's right. Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God, over a, dangling you over a fire pit. The wrath of God when they took away the preaching the Lord at school. I can't oh, think. I see. Oh, so could well be. Well, I have a ritual on Thursdays. All week long, we fill up the trash bins in the house and they are disgusting. You know, when you lose something, <laughs> you really don't want to go digging around in the trash. I don't know why. What is it about that? All the dirty Kleenexes and who knows what all's in the kitchen, and especially the bathroom, wastebasket, you just don't want to dig around in there. So on Thursdays, I collect all those waste baskets and <laughs> dump them in the trash in one big bag, a large blue bin there. And then the whole neighborhood stinks until the truck comes. And the wrath of God is like that. What? Pastor Lynn, you're saying God thinks of people as garbage? Well, it's the principle I'm talking about. Some behavior is just so disgusting, and we know it is too, don't we? We don't even want to talk about it. Certainly don't want it on TV. Some behavior of humans is so disgusting that God just wants it out of his presence. What behavior are we talking about? Like when I was going to high school, drinking, chewing, smoking, going to movies, all the girls would do all those things. I didn't do that. Of course, my girl was 200 miles away. <laughs> what does God want and what does he find repellent? What is so disgusting to God? Well, our text today sheds a little light on this. John 3, 36. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. But the one who refuses to believe in the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. <laughs> now, this is John, and he's getting into theology here. And so that's why we got to talk. In fact, we're just going to scratch the surface today. This is, there's a lot in, in this little verse. He's backed a whole lot in here. We need to understand about what is believing in Jesus, and we need to understand today, we're going to try to understand what the wrath of God is. You heard all the different ideas of it. And why does it remain, that word? What is that? You know, a lot of people think, as, as Jean pointed out, think of the wrath of God, they think of a symbol of fire. They think of an angry old man casting fire for what seems to be no apparent reason. We think of natural disasters. In fact, we, we call them acts of God, as if God made volcanoes and earthquakes and all these things, that, and floods and all this stuff that God is somehow punishing people. Some people have this idea, there's this angry old man doing all this stuff. But you know what? That's not the God of the Bible. That's Zeus, his pagan idea. Or the Norse god, Odin, or Thor, it's, you know, that's a pagan idea. The Bible paints a different picture of God. So what is the wrath of God, and why does it remain? Okay, to understand wrath, we pretty much need to understand what God cares about. Because if you're... Somebody's going to get mad at you about something. You want to know why, don't you? Of course you do. It isn't just something arbitrary, usually. 
So let's begin with the Ten Commandments. I think that's probably where we should start, trying to understand what God cares about. Why did God give the Ten Commandments? That's a big question. Why did he give them? Well, if you read the book of Genesis, it's a very instructive book. It, it, it tells how Israel began, but that isn't really all it says in there. It shows how humans went from being very good to bad to worse. That's what Genesis shows us. Adam and Eve, they refused to be governed by God. So God removed them from his presence. And their first son murdered their second son. And why did he murder him? Over religion. Cain had made up his own religion. And he rejected God's advice. Not advice, apparently God had told him how to sacrifice and he decided to do it his own way. Made up his own religion. And murdered his brother. Sound familiar? Religion continues like that. And so God sent Cain away from his presence, banished him. Evil, I mean, humans grew in evil arrogance like that. And so God removed all life from his presence, the ultimate removal in, in the flood, and uh, preserved Noah and his family. He uh, did like my kids used to do when I was teaching elementary school. They would make one little mark on a white piece of paper and want another piece of paper, or another kid would be sitting there and he'd erase his entire drawing and waste the entire period. And so God was trying to erase everybody. Well, that didn't work either, because Noah's family still carried on the seed of Adam and the rebellious not wanting to submit to God's rule. Humans refused to submit to God, so we let them go their own way. And they began to invent all kinds of disastrous religions. You can read about them in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and all through there. Don't be like the people around you, God kept telling the Israelites. These are disastrous religions because they've forgotten God and what God wants. They exploited one another, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Ezekiel tells us what was wrong with Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 16, verse 9. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, prosperous ease. You see, this is their own sins. Isn't that crazy? That's kind of hitting pretty close to home for me. But they didn't aid the poor and needy among them. That's what made God mad with Sodom and Gomorrah. They were haughty. They did an abomination. They tried to rape angels. So, I removed them, God said. But God did have one man he could trust. And through him, he began a program to rescue humans from this predilection to lawlessness that we have. Abram, he chose Abram because Abram believed him. And so from that one man, he decided to build a people, a people who remember what God cares about. Okay, let's fast forward then to the Ten Commandments. Let's see what God cares about. The Ten Commandments are in two parts. One part is how to treat God. It says there's one God, worship only him. That's reality. It only makes sense if that's the way reality really is, that there's one God, that of course you'd want to worship that God. It just makes rational sense to obey him, considering who he is. The second part is how to treat people. So you got how to treat God, how to treat people. He prohibits treating other people as objects for your use. It makes living together enjoyable. That's what God wants. The second part of the Ten Commandments prohibits behavior that makes life miserable. He wants people to get along and enjoy each other. And 
not treat each other as objects. That's what God cares about. He cares that we love him and that we love each other and that we act in love towards each other. Old Testament prophetic witness and message to the wealthy and powerful in Micah's day, listen to this. You, he's talking to the leaders of Israel, you eat the flesh of my people after you strip their skin from them and break their bones, you chop them up like flesh for a cooking pot, like meat in a cauldron. Then the leaders will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them because he's angry. The wrath of God is coming on these leaders of Israel. He will hide his face from him. You see again? Removing him from his presence, he's hiding himself. He's hiding his face from them at that time because of the crimes they have committed. They were even worse than the religions that went before them. They would made their own religion that had nothing to do with God to the point of even roasting their own children over fires while they were still alive. That's what they were doing. Treating other people like that. God tells them, stop this hypocritical worship and exploitation. Amos 5.24 says, but let justice flow down like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. That's what God wants. He wants justice. He wants people to treat each other right. But they didn't respond. They continued to worship idols with this horrific tradition and exploit one another in 2 Kings 17, 18 to 20. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and he removed them from his presence. Again, you see that? Removed them from his presence. God finds them so disgusting he can't have them, he can't have them around. Only the tribe of Judah remained. Even Judah did not keep the commands of the Lord their God but lived according to the customs Israel had introduced. Again, we just described so the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, afflicted them, handed them over to plunderers until he had banished them from his presence. You see what God did? Israel only existed because they were protected by God with his presence. He removed his protection. That was, their, that was the wrath of God. And so all Assyria and Babylon, Babylonia came and took him away from the presence of God. The presence of God, of course, was symbolized by the temple. They had become a stench, it says in the Old Testament, in the nostrils of God, just like the trash bin. And there you go, that's why the trash bin. A stench. So the wrath of God threw them away to Babylon and to Assyria. And in exile there, exile was their trash bin, I guess, but there, God remembered his people because they began to cry out to him. They remembered that God wanted justice and mercy and love. They cried out to him, Psalm 89, 46. How long, O Lord, they said, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? You see, it's, the fire symbol is regret that they felt that the, the emotional pain of being away from home and, and being in the society of evil people who exploit one another. How long will your wrath burn like fire? It's suffering. It's, it's regret. It's not literal flames, although literal flames is one of the things that happened when they were taken away, when the Babylonians took over their country. Then they remembered him and cried out to him, and God responded with a steadfast love. It says in Psalm 103, 8 to 9, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, rich in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or, or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our offenses. For high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love for those who fear him. So there's some good news there. God's wrath is not the end of the story. In fact, you can see in Ezekiel that God left the temple and went to Babylon and dug him out of the trash and brought 
a remnant back to Israel. He remembered them. So what can we learn from the Old Testament story of Israel? Wrath, the wrath of God, removes disgusting people from his presence, people who have disgusting behaviors. He removes them from his presence. But humans refuse to submit to God. And when he does, when we do, he lets us go. And that letting us go is removing us from his presence, you see? He just lets us do what we want to do. And that results in all these dysfunctional behaviors. Conflicts and wars, terrible abuses of humans, divorces, all this painful stuff that goes on in our lives. God lets us go and lets us do those things. And that's his wrath. His wrath is letting us have our way without him. Hmm. But that's not what he wants. He wants peaceful, joyful lives where we enjoy each other in community, together, in his presence. That's what he wants. He wants us to be happy. Isn't that good? God loves people. And he wants us to behave like that to each other. He wants us to behave in love, not in disgusting ways. The New Testament continues this theme. And we start with our text again, John 3:36. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who refuses to believe in the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. In the New Testament, God provides this permanent solution. Now, you see the word refuse? We're talking about a very specific group of people here. We're not talking about people who haven't known about Jesus. These are people who knew and refused, who understood and refused, particularly, of course, in the New Testament, we're talking about the Jews in Jesus' day that refused, that, that crucified him. People who know that God has provided a way and refuse that way are judged according to what they know. People who don't know about Jesus are judged according to what they've done. We've all, we're all judged according to what we've done. We can't talk about the people who didn't know about Jesus today. We're just talking about those who know. We're trying to understand the wrath of God is what we're doing. The Ten Commandments and all the other laws in Leviticus and so on, it didn't work because people didn't want to do them. And so the wrath remained. People still continued to treat each other as objects. God provided a way for humans to have fellowship with God and with each other. God provided his son Jesus. Jesus, it says that he is the exact image and radiance of God. When you see Jesus, you see the nature of God. So what made Jesus angry? That would tell us what God cares about in the New Testament. The Ten Commandments, he was angry with unbelief and actions that harmed other people. The anger of Jesus tells us what God wants. So what made Jesus angry? Evil spirits that held people captive. Hard-hearted religious leaders. They had a pretense of holiness, but they said his work was from demons. They had a pretense of holiness, but they greedily defrauded the poor. They prevented people from worshiping God. They contemptuously, unmercifully enforced impossible codes of behavior. This sounds a lot like those extremist Muslims, doesn't it? But it also sounds like a lot of Christians I know. 
Unbelief made Jesus angry. The towns and people who didn't receive him or his disciples made him angry. He was angry with James and John when they wanted to call fire down from heaven on the Samaritan village. He was angry with people tempting children to sin. And by that he also meant tempting his disciples to sin. He was angry with an unproductive fig tree because it symbolized hard-hearted Israel. And he was angry with the religious leaders having this market where the Gentiles were supposed to worship God, preventing them from worship. He was angry with Peter because Peter was tempting him to avoid the cross. He was angry with his disciples when they rebuked a distraught woman who, who poured fragrant oil on Jesus. He was angry with Judas for betraying him. Okay, that's what made Jesus angry. So what does God want? Matthew 2, 36 to 40 sums it up. Somebody asked him, the teacher, what command in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. God wants people to love both him and each other. And it makes him angry and disappointed when we don't. He finds it disgusting. People are eternal. Our bodies die, but we live on. And what's apparently true is that our attitudes continue to live on. Our attitudes toward each other and our attitudes toward God. What causes the wrath of God to remain on us? What causes God to remove us from our presence, from his presence after we die? Scripture says we will. What causes them to do that? Our lack of love for him and for other people. And the behavior that comes from that. You've heard this before, Matthew 25, 41 to 46. This is the second half of this. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, ye who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, you didn't take care of me. And they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger with, or without clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you didn't do for me either. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Can you see what God cares about? God wants us to love God and to act like it. And he wants us to love other people and to act like it. To do what love does. So he holds us accountable on how we treat other people. Do you, you think you can act like the devil and still go to heaven? No. The Bible says no. John says, you yeah, act like that, how can the love of God be in you? There's a lot of Christians like that. People who think they are, anyway. Instead, the wrath of God remains on you. God will just let you go. Do what you want to do. He'll let you do whatever you want to do with all the attendant dysfunctional results. And that will continue into eternity, apparently. Dysfunctional results. The wrath of God is letting us go our own way now and forever out of his presence. Jesus likened the absence of love to burning with fire, a whole lake of fire. Regret and blaming and anger, life bloody and tooth and claw. Kind of like one of Anne Rand's books. 
Galatians 6, 7 to 10. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Of course, not just talking about men, right? Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap corruption from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So we must not get tired of doing good. For we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Especially for those who belong to the household of faith. And of course, part of doing good is believing God, right? In the Ten Commandments. And what did God tell us? That he has provided salvation for those who find ourselves doing things that aren't good, that are disgusting. He's provided a way for us. Because we don't seem to be able to do good all the time, not consistent. He's done it through Jesus. As God said through Paul in Ephesians 2, 3 to 8, we were by nature children under wrath, as others also were. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Together with Christ Jesus, he also raised us up and seated us in the heavens. Even now, it's present tense. <clears throat> so that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. That's not on yourself. It's God's gift. Believe it. Thank <laughs> you.